Welcome to visit four. We're going to talk about your neck and your eyes and your ears. You can't get away. Those three are, are tied together. Uh, so for this cervical spine bucket, the first two videos are going to be just kind of uh, heady lectures, kind of understanding why we're doing what we're doing. If you want to skip that, the, the other videos are just hands-on uh, or like uh, hands-on neck uh, exercises to for soft tissue mobilization and release of some common muscles and common triggers behind headaches, dizziness, blurred vision, ocular symptoms, cognitive symptoms, physical symptoms of concussion. Um, so if you want to jump right ahead to the practical kind of meat and potatoes, feel it, dig into it, um, practical material, go for it. Um, if you want to know why and how this all makes sense, um, stick around because we're going to talk about whiplash for concussion. Uh, chicken or the egg, is it your neck or is it your brain? And does it even matter? So this session is a bit more philosophical and nerdy, but it helps to understand why we're digging into your neck in the first place. So let's first look at whiplash and concussion. So on paper, the symptoms of concussion and the symptoms of whiplash look nearly identical. Um, concussion really comes down to the clinical diagnosis. You need a mechanism of injury, you need symptoms, you need a physical exam to rule out the big scaries, to compare it to baseline tests, the PCSS, the CP screen, the River Mead bombs questionnaires, um, different things to say, was this a concussion? Um, but if you didn't have these and you only had symptoms, it would be really hard to tell a cervical or a whiplash injury from concussion. So there's headaches, there's dizziness, there's ringing in the ears, there's irritability, there's sleep disturbances, blurred vision, neck stiffness, balance issues, depression, cognitive deficits, uh, memory deficits. I'm not actually sure if those are in cervical injury, so that I didn't correct that X. Um, there's attention deficits, increased cervical, decreased cervical range of motion in both, and decreased isometric neck strength in both. Uh, what I added here is that we do see depression in orthopedic injuries, so that's just not true to say that it doesn't show up in whiplash. We do see decreased cervical range of motion in concussion because all concussion has whiplash, so it's not okay to say that. And I completely blocked out chronic traumatic encephalopathy, or CTE, um, because they said that concussion has it and cervical injury doesn't. And we just don't know that yet. Um, so that might upset some people. That'll definitely upset the New York Times people or people who watch the documentary Concussion. Um, but what we know is that there's a massive bias in CTE studies. Um, so people that donate their brains for CTE likely already had a movement disorder, a mood disorder, a neurological disorder, and a history of sports. But we haven't gotten brains from people who have mood disorder, movement disorder, um, and, and neurological disorder that never played contact sports. And when we are getting more data on people who never played sports, um, we're finding CTE in those people as well. We're finding CTE in people who didn't have a history of, of head injury. We're finding less CTE um, in contact athletes as more athletes donate their brains. So the jury on CTE is out. So to put it in a hard chart like this in a study was a bit premature, so I just crossed it out. Uh, we don't know enough about CTE yet. But the point of the slide was not CTE. The point of the slide was that whiplash and concussion look nearly identical. Why is that? Because the linear force required for a concussion far exceeds the linear force required for whiplash. So the linear acceleration here, if you shook and jostled your brain for an acceleration, deceleration injury of a concussion, you absolutely had enough acceleration and deceleration whip in the neck to cause a cervical injury, to cause whiplash. Concussion happens at around 70 to 120 Gs of force. Whiplash happens around four to five Gs of force. Um, so again, concussion is around 100, 120 Gs of like, whoa. Whiplash happens around four to five Gs. Um, so it's been said that all concussions come with whiplash, but not all whiplash comes with concussion. So go back and look at that symptom list, reread the sentence about concussions and whiplash. Now tell me you can fix a concussion with only nutrition supplements and visual vestibular rehab. Uh, you can't. You can't only nutrition a, a, a concussion. You can't only visual vestibular concussion. You have to do some active rehab, subsymptom threshold aerobic activity for the autonomic component. And you also have to address the neck because we've, we've got studies that if you stiffen the neck, I don't know if I talk about this, uh, we don't. So if, if you stiffen the neck in cats, um, and you drop little weights at their head, if their neck doesn't move and they can't create acceleration or deceleration, they won't concuss. Um, so your neck has to be involved for you to have a concussion. So to not address the neck is to not address the one piece attaching your brain and your head to your body. So the chicken or the egg, is it the neck or is it the brain? Um, I'm not even gonna pretend to separate these two for the next few slides. Um, 
I want you to try this. Turn your head right, now turn your head left. What moved? Your head and your neck moved. What made you do that? Your brain and your nervous system. So your neck and your brain are super linked. You cannot do any of this without brain, and you cannot do any of this without head and neck. Um, so to say, was it the brain, was it the neck, doesn't matter. Um, there are tests that can point us in a direction of neck proprioception bias. So proprioception is your ability to feel your body in space. If you close your eyes, you reach your hand out and you close your fist and you point one finger and then two fingers, you can feel that it's two fingers. You don't question, is it all four? You know that it's two because of proprioception. Um, so you can actually, there's tests that I can do in office and there's tests that concussion specialists can do in office that can tell us, is it because your neck has a proprioception problem or is it because your brain has an integration problem? So is the problem more because your neck is wonky or because your visual or your vestibular systems are wonky? So some example tests are cervical joint position error. So we'll put a laser on your head, shooting out at the wall like a cat laser, and we'll ask you to turn your head all the way, close your eyes, and come back to center. And what we'll find is that people cannot find center. They don't know where neutral is when their eyes are closed. And that might be because of your cervical spine. When we stretch it and we disrupt those muscle spindles, when we stretch and come back, we don't know where we're at because our neck is wonky. Uh, the smooth pursuit neck torsion test is like the VOMS assessment when we do smooth pursuits, but we test it with your head off to the side and your head off to the side. And we might see that you feel good forward, you feel good to the right, but when we turn your head left, you get dizzy or headaches or blurry vision. Um, and that tells us that when your neck is stretched kind of in this left rotation, those muscles are probably involved. Um, and we can do lots of other tests, but those are a couple of big ones. So chicken or egg, does it matter? Um, probably not. So following a concussion, headache is one of the most common symptoms experienced and it's most commonly tension type or cervicogenic. So cervico, cervical spine, genic, genesis, origination. So originating from the cervical spine. So uh, tension type headaches or migraine headaches. In both cases, you need to address the cervical spine or the biomechanics as a part of complete treatment. So following a concussion, folks also experience ocular and vestibular symptoms. If the neck is providing the brain with bad info or bad noise, then that's what the vestibular system and the visual system have to work with. So again, cervical spine and biomechanics matter. So does it, does it matter if it's the brain or if it's the neck? No, it probably doesn't. We're just picking pepper out of the salt shaker there. So the cervical spine and concussion recap, there's a lot of nuance there, so what do I want you to know? The cervical spine should be addressed in concussion care, period. Even if you're dealing with non-neck symptoms, your cervical and upper thoracic spines, your upper thoracic kind of where we see that hunch from sitting around Zoom all day, um, that region might be involved. And because of this connection, it's gonna benefit you to perform soft tissue manipulation and corrective exercise therapies. We're gonna outline some several at-home options for you in this module, um, but we just needed to get through this nerdy stuff first. So you and your brain are not broken. We're going to keep coming back to this point until you understand it and believe it. After a concussion, you can make significant progress by addressing your neck because there is almost guaranteed to be a whiplash component. Your head is only attached to your body via your neck. You'd think this would be the first thing that we address, right? Um, so in the next session, we're going to chat soft tissue mobilizations. We're actually going to talk fascia, um, just a, like a heads up. Uh, you're going to need one to two lacrosse balls and a foam roller, ideally textured and spiky. Um, I got mine for like 20 bucks at Costco. Um, but a couple of lacrosse balls, a couple of tennis balls. The cross balls are a little bit better because tennis balls are kind of hollow on the inside and can compress. Um, but a couple things to kind of scrub and mobilize and, and give you some proprioceptive feedback that you'll need in the next couple of sessions. But first, let's talk about fascia and why these tools are useful for you in concussion rehab.